everyone. Many thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Hannah Wallace and I am currently working in an associate capacity with Nottingham Contemporary to co-conceive and deliver this Caption Conscious Ecology programme with Sarah Hayden, uh, who I'll pass you over to shortly. Just to share a really quick self-description, I am a white woman in her early 30s. I have wavy brown hair to just above my shoulders and I'm wearing a, a black tank top. I wear um, small gold hoops in my ears and I also have a cochlear implant on my right ear. In the background, you can see a painting to my right, uh, to my left, sorry, and a door to my right. Um, so just before Sarah introduces our excellent uh, guest for tonight, I just wanted to share some brief housekeeping notes. So our live programme of talks, performances, screenings, seek to create a challenging environment where open-mindedness and respect for each other's experiences and perspectives can foster growth. We will keep a really informal atmosphere throughout the evening. And although public intervention is limited in today's digital formats, we welcome you to join the conversation as much as you can. You can use the chat on YouTube to write your questions and comments as we go through the session. And Sarah will kindly share these during the discussion in the second half of the event. I just want to take this opportunity to show our gratitude to the a AHRC funding that has generously and graciously supporting the Caption Conscious Ecology project through Sarah's Voices in the Gallery project, as well as acknowledging my colleagues, Catherine, Chanan and Jim, who are supporting us this evening at Nottingham Contemporary. So just a quick note on access for the evening. All of the events as part of the Caption Conscious Ecology Project, um, including tonight, we have BSL interpretation. Today, that's thanks to Sarah Perks and Rebecca Spencer. We also have live captioning, thanks to Andrew. So if you'd like to activate the captions on your device, you can click the closed caption button in the corner of the YouTube screen. For tonight's screening, Louise Hickman, one of our guest speakers, is also going to provide a live audio description of the film that she'll be showing. An edited version of the talks will be made available online shortly after the event has ended and you'll be able to return to these conversations over the time that suits you. We also hope that you will share them with people who can't be present for the live stream tonight. So I'll pass you over to Sarah now, who's moderating tonight's discussion, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Hello everyone, and welcome to the first event in Caption Conscious Ecology. I'm Sarah Hayden. I'm a white woman wearing big shoulder pads, which make for maybe a more recognizable silhouette on screen. I have quite a mixed up kind of Irish accent. Uh, I'm moving around sort of Irish accent, a bit like a leprechaun, which might also help you to tie my name to my face as I'm speaking. This four part series has been devised through a partnership, as Hannah has said, between Nottingham Contemporary and Voices in the Gallery, this research project that I lead on voice, art and access. More specifically and socially, this series comes about through a very close, generative, merry collaboration between curator Hannah, Hannah Wallace and myself. The impetus to organize Caption Conscious Ecology arose from a will to open a set of conversations about accessibility in moving image and voice-driven arts practices. We set out to draw together insights on captioning and media access from activists, from access workers and scholars across the fields of communication, critical disability studies and deaf studies. What we wanted to do was to share with new communities the exciting foment of work being made by artists out of and through access means, artworks that explore, exemplify the poetic potentiality. And I say that with a nod to Shannon Finnegan and Bojana Cochleat of captioning and of audio description. Work by some of these artists will be screened as part of these conversation sessions, and we'll be making an announcement soon with details on that. So that's the point where I tantalize you with what's still being held back before later dripping further news of what's, what's to come. Through the workshops in the series, we're hoping to prompt artists and artworks, arts workers to begin to think about how 
and why captioning could be embedded in what they do from the point of conception rather than as a fix or a sort of compliance widget that's laid on over the top in post-production. If any of you are keen right now to mark your calendars for the future, our next talk will be on protest and practice, and that'll be with Jaypreet Verdi and Collective Text and some soon to be announced screenings on October 14th. As well as those two talk sessions, there'll be a captioning workshop for artists led by Asad Raza and Olivia Fairweather on October 8th, and one for curators and arts workers led by Eleanor Morgan, together with Hannah and myself on October 21st. You don't need to remember all of that now. In any case, you'll find information on how to sign up for all of these on the Nottingham Contemporary and the Voices in the Gallery websites. In conceiving of these events, Hannah and myself, we were compelled to harness some broad realizations experienced by many living and working extra online this past year and a half in a strangely synced, in some cases, pandemic context. These were belated realizations in many cases, including I'll readily admit my own, realizations about the responsibility to consider digital spaces as public space, spaces that need to be accessible. Media access matters, access to art media matters within and far beyond the spaces in which that art is immediately encountered. As Elizabeth Elsesser has argued in her words, the ability to participate culturally and civically is closely tied to the ability to use, to consume, to watch, to make sense of one's surrounding media environment. So the public value that's at stake when media are made accessible or not, or when art is made accessible or not, is that of citizen equality. I'd suggest we keep this in mind in thinking about the political work of and in contemporary art. Captioning, as we're going to learn from Jay Preet on October 14th, has its roots in resistance. It has its roots in the activism of deaf and disabled people, and its provision remains political. It needs to remain political. In plotting this series through periods of closures and special measures, we were conscious too of conversations that were afoot then and that continue now about what should happen next, what changes in creative and curatorial practice could or should be carried out, back out as people were saying, but maybe we could query that, into the spaces, the physical and the virtual spaces of art, into our hopefully hybrid art future. Which is to say, really, there's the question of captioning material online, but there's also the question of captioning in the museum or in the gallery. Learning to ensure that online art presentations and events are captioned, that they're audio described, that they're advertised with alt text, cues a reappraisal, it should cue a reappraisal, we think, of the very often partial and contingent accessibility or otherwise of the public spaces within which moving image art is commissioned and within which it's shown. It's not enough, it's never, it never was enough to have accessible websites and inaccessible exhibitions, performances and screenings. So taking our cue from Carolyn Lazard, we're going to be trying to imagine access as, in their words, a speculative practice and caption consciousness as one move towards establishing, to borrow Lazard's words, a more inclusive foundation for the cultural work that an arts organization does. Our hope is that these events might contribute to, could even possibly fertilize the germination of a more caption conscious ecology, a shift in attitudes and expectations, but also, and crucially a shift, and we mean for a, a meaningful one, a long lasting one in institutional and making practices, one that might permeate how moving image meets its audiences and or its viewers, its receivers. We very much want to draw other people into these events and their legacies. And on that, we'll have more details to come in future. So if this work intersects with your own, with your own interests and um, your own activities, do get in touch with us. We're keen to keep learning and we're gonna be thinking about captioning for a long while yet. I smile at Hannah with that. It's a kind of a, almost like a, a threat and a promise to Hannah. We're still gonna be thinking about captioning beyond, uh, beyond these events. I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers in a moment, and then we're going to have Tanya Tichkowski, who'll speak on encountering access as perception. Louise Hickman then will first give a short introduction to the film Captioning on Captioning by Louise Hickman and Shannon Finnegan. We'll screen the film and Louise is going to audio describe us 
audio describe it to us live, which is a really exciting um, proposition, a very generous thing to do. And then Louise will segue into a short talk titled More Abundance, Less Austerity. We'll take a short break for five minutes. You can run and grab a drink and come back. Um, and then we're going to have a conversation and we'll be open then to your questions and really keen um, for your contributions. Dr. Tanya Tishkowski is a professor in social justice education at OISE, that's the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto, teaching and writing in the area of disability studies for more than 20 years. Some of her books include Disability, Self and Society, 2003, as well as Reading and Writing Disability Differently, 2007, and The Question of Access, Disability, Space, Meaning, 2011. Tanya works from the position that whatever else disability is, it is tied up with the human imagination, steeped in mostly unexamined conceptions of normalcy, and that's normalcy in inverted commas. This disability studies research and teaching orientation relies on other critical approaches to inquiry that question the grounds of Western ways of knowing, such as phenomenology influenced by black, queer, and indigenous studies. By grappling with the act of interpretation, Tanya hopes to reveal the restricted imaginaries that surround our lives in and with disability. With co-editors, she has a new reader coming out in 2022. I would mark my diary with that news too, titled Disappearing Encounters in Disability Studies. Dr. Louise Hickman is an activist and scholar of communication and uses ethnographic, archival and theoretical approaches to consider how access is produced for disabled and deaf people. Her current project focuses particularly on access produced by real-time stenographers and transcriptive technologies in educational settings. She uses an interdisciplinary lens drawing on feminist theory, critical disability studies, and science and technology studies to consider the historical conditions of access work and the ways access is co-produced through human and primarily female labor, technological systems, and economic models and conditions. Louise is a research associate, associate at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy, hosted at the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, that's most often known as CRASH, which always sounds, I think, quite exciting, at the University of Cambridge. Louise is also a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. She holds a PhD in communication from the University of California, San Diego, and is currently working on her eagerly anticipated first manuscript, Crip AI, the automation of access. As I think should already, I hope, be clear, these bios are more than enough in themselves to explain why Tanya and Louise are our guests tonight. Their generous, rigorous, and often poetic thinking was foundational to our imagining of these events. In trying to think about what a captioned conscious ecology could achieve, we were thinking particularly how of how, in the question of access, Tanya overturns and overwrites the understanding, in her words, of disability access issues as a thoroughly individualized matter. We were thinking of how Tanya surfaces the ways in which the construction and constitution of social spaces legitimate some bodies, some sensoria, and delegitimate others as potentially excludable. Thinking with Tanya, we come to understand how the advertising of a single one-time event as captioned or as BSL interpreted as a special feature might show up what she calls the assumption of a general lack of access. That assumption predicated on a conception of disability as, in Tanya's words again, not yet something to which a community needs to respond, at least not all the time. That assumption still everywhere pervades. Making captions a given, communicates an expanded expectation of who is making and who is engaging with moving image. It enacts an expansion of the community of those who can or who could. We've been thinking too of the utterly timely attention that Louise brings to, in her words, the production of access as an important object of study in and of itself, and specifically about speech to text translations as social texts. Louise highlights the entanglement of care, subject specific transcoding expertise and what Mia Mingus and Sandy Ho call access intimacy in real time captioning. Louise shows us that the work of CART captioners and stenographers as well as audio describers and sign language interpreters is always affective, it is always situated, it's always relational. 
Louise is writing about, in her words, the deployment of what are too often considered to be neutral or transparent technologies at a moment when the automation of access is everywhere proffered as an easy fix. In this moment when access is increasingly spoken of and increasingly misrepresented, misunderstood. So before I hand over to Tanya, allow me to say finally, thanks to all of you so much for being here this evening. Thanks for tuning in and thanks to Louise and Tanya for taking up this invitation. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Tanya from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where today it's the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, the first uh, the inaugural uh, time of uh, trying to reflect on what um, white settlers have done to Indigenous peoples and the loss of many children. And I just would like to thank um, Sarah and Hannah for your reflective orientation, which I think is part of what the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is trying to um, nurture in us, is the, what um, Hannah called a cue to reappraisal. And I hope that um, this event participates in uh, us developing that um, interest in and commitment to being cued for a reappraisal. And I'm really thrilled to be here and thanks so much for this opportunity and uh, hope to share a, little, a few of my thoughts on um, a caption conscious ecology. So thanks very much. I'm really grateful to both Sam, uh, Sarah and Hannah for raising, nurturing a consideration, even um, a consciousness for access and inclusion that I hope to contribute to today. And they've asked two questions or approached us with some questions. One was, why we need to caption moving image work? And they also asked, how to go about making this a, a given in creative and institutional practice, which the introduction did such a great job of setting that up as an issue. Moving image work is an expansive and inclusive category of the arts. And it's likely something I'm imagining that you do. It, it might be part of your identity. There might be some people who say, I am a moving image creator. There may also be some of you that identify as a captioner and you know this language and its art. I though, I don't identify as either. I don't know the language and arts of captioning, nor of moving images. I'm an interpretive sociologist doing disability studies who is dyslexic. So what is this middle-aged, white-looking blonde woman who can still do cartwheels doing here then? I have shown such work to disabled, to mad, divergent, and dyslexic people, including myself. I've watched the use of codes and practices behind the doing of captioning and image production. From dyslexia, I remain amazed and frankly baffled at the potential intimacy of the languages and practices shared between captioning and moving image work. That this intimacy is so often denied or happens only after creation rather than during or that imaging and captioning become discordant. This too is also amazing and baffling. With this perplexity as provocation, I hope we can consider the ecology. Uh, and ecology is that house of living relations, the root of the word ecology, a house of living relations between captioning and moving image creation. Well, the relations between creators of images or captioning can lead into acts of reduction and confusion, degradation. We might encounter these differently by joining with Hannah and Sarah in their way of wondering why we need to caption moving image work, how to go about making this a given. Answer is access, of course. And I'm reminded at this point that there might be a um, outline of the of my talk that's been put into chat. Yeah, 
Thanks. The answer why caption seems obvious for access, of course, and for an expand and I should say this with more emphasis for an expanded audience, a more nuanced sense of community, caption for community to be responsive to who and what we are. People that are not all the same, especially when it comes to hearing and seeing and speaking and other forms of sensual discernment. Working from the assumption of perceptual and communicative differences as the beginning place of creation seems to be an obvious solution. Despite the obvious, we still find ourselves without a close and ongoing relation to the question, why caption? The routines of access, even the mere question of access seems to fall away quickly, easily. Maybe the task of combining creation and access, captioning moving image creation, has never been fully established. Given it isn't established, when the access mandate leaves our consciousness or the access person leaves our creative team, poof, it's gone. Captioning is imagined mostly after creation, as Hannah, Sarah was saying. Despite the obvious answer or solution, include captioning as a starting point. It seems so much more complicated than it first appears. And maybe we have to hang on to the questions that Hannah and Sarah have given us for just a little bit longer. So here's a story. One way I tried to hang on to questions of access, despite how easily they slip from our imagination. It's a story which I hope um, isn't just a lament, but invites us to pursue a politics of wonder. Back in 2006, I started anew, becoming a faculty member at the more or less accessible big urban University of Toronto, where I am today. I had left a more or less inaccessible, small liberal arts rural East Coast University. But my move to the big university came with a shock. For all their big city ways, and signs that everywhere said, captioning, signs that everywhere said, we are accessible. There wasn't even an accessible toilet in the large building where my office was located and where I would teach. Uh, for the Canadians who might be listening, uh, the word there is washroom, but toilet for those who are in the UK. No accessible toilet. There were, however, signs everywhere that said otherwise. The collective eye of my new workplace seemed fooled by the blue and white stick figure using a wheelchair. This icon of access was posted on many heavy, narrow doors throughout the building, including inaccessible toilet doors. How could I keep my job? How could I keep my paycheck as a new disability studies professor if I worked in a building that didn't even have an accessible toilet. I had trouble sleeping, knowing that I worked for an organization that didn't seem to know that disabled students, faculty and staff were not there, were missing in action. It took a few years, but we did get signs taken down and toilets and other accessibility features were built, but then we'd find them shut down or locked up. So I began to create, to write about these encounters, to narrate them as they came with a lack of a desire for and a lack of an interest in disability experience. And in a workplace that nonetheless had icons of access strewn seemingly everywhere. My writing somehow transformed itself into a book, The Question of Access, and I wrote not only to sleep better, but to keep my spirit intact and also to try to make sense of a situation where inaccessibility was perceived as either not interesting or justifiable or not noticed at all. No toilet or no captioning, 
makes for a highly exclusionary environment. And yet it remains the norm and it's readily justified. Despite the obvious lack of access, this lack was made to make sense. People said, too expensive, too complicated. No one's gonna use it anyway. These justifications were ready at hand for all the people who felt their belonging, who felt their fit. Clearly, whatever else access or lack of access is, it must be more than a task or a rule or a new routine. But what is it? Pursuing such a question requires a politics of wonder. It turns out that writing a book that helped me sleep better also has a few gems in it for waking me up to the question of access and to wondering about what we are after. I suggested in that book that practices of access, new or old, are really forms of perception, ways of sensing and imagining people and their environment. Simply put, we only ever raise access questions or make access for and imagine someone or something that we perceive to be in need of access. Even though access is always at issue, it's rarely a question that's asked. We have to perceive a need in order to ask it. It's a form of perception. After all, some versions of access are always there, but it's taken for granted and remains more or less unquestioned. For example, lights in the room or on Zoom, name tags on our person or under our picture, sounds, mic off, mic on, all of this is access for sighted and hearing people, but it's regarded as normal and then not as access at all. Somehow such access practices leave the realm of the question of access and become just the way things are until and unless something goes wrong. One thing this means is that the ecology that is the house of our living relations is imagined from a particular able-bodied, non-disabled perspective. This metaphoric house, it's lights, doors, steps, windows, furniture, sound, becomes taken as just the way things are. And if this doesn't fit someone, well, it's just the way things go. It is the person and not the house that is understood to be the problem. A lack of fit and you become an exception. Imagined as a person with the condition, a condition that typically only represents a lack of fit or limited function. One way to consider how access is a form of perception is by considering the universal icon of access. So I'm um, just asking you to imagine that right now. A white stick figure sitting in a in a white round circle with a bright blue background. It's a still image, it's almost never captioned, although sometimes it has braille on it, which is sort of, you wonder how you find the icon and braille it, but, and how does it work? Someone makes the icon, but they put it here and not there. Someone else has to look for it here and there, but not everywhere. Icons everywhere wouldn't make sense. We know to look for the icon because we assume, because we know, maybe even the icon teaches us that exclusion is the norm. We have an assumption of exclusion as the norm, and therefore we can perceive where to go find access. This imagined meaning of disability is a lack of fit with just the th way things are, leads to a logic or a language of naturalized exclusion. It starts to seem natural to exclude or to include disability, but imagined only as a limit and lack that we'd rather live without since it doesn't fit the house of our living relations, does not fit the ecology of just the way things are. 
Instead of imagining disability as a lively experience, as a form of sensuality that is already in the house, part of our living relation, we ask instead, how far do we really need to go given disability experience seems outside the loop of normal life? For the creator though, the image maker, the captioner, the book writer, the dissertation writer, matters must be different. Everything about just the way things are is the place of your creations. Creators, artists, know that what is perceived is made. Know that there's no perception outside of human relations, the human imaginary, imagination. Imagination and perception are always tied. The moving image artist and captioner know, they must know, that perception is cultural and know this very deeply. How else can we create? Perhaps this is why James Baldwin, uh, B-A-L-D-W-I-N, back in 1962, says that societies always have trouble with their artists, since the artist is the incorrigible disturber of the peace. The artist disturbs the peace found in the sensual certainty, this is just the way things are. Creators disturb the peace of the taken for granted. However, from the perspective of the everyday, the readily available perspective, disability is represented in an unimaginative, an unimaginative even inhumane way. Disabled people are those who appear as having a lack of function, a person who has a loss of fit. This is an image unmoved, dominant. It needs to be disturbed or else a creation of any sort is reduced to a reproduction of just the way things are, the status quo. This is why caption-friendly ecology cannot happen merely by shifting the rules or mandating the practices, since the act of captioning might only include disability as lack of function, loss of fit. There's little social change that could be found in mandating a policy for a new practice without truly wondering, disturbing, recreating what we're already doing. To create, we need to perceive how we have already imagined who or what is in need of access. And I think here's the cool thing. Images of access, and those in need of access, images of those perceived as having a lack of function and loss of fit can, can be made to matter as a space, space of creation. We can, after all, denaturalize our perception simply by asking, where is disability? Is disability or deafness included as anything other than lack of function and loss of fit? By asking such questions, creation can start again. Imagining disability experience as a starting point for creation, as already part of the house of our living relations, is a radical task for creators of images and captioners. There are many practices, including new ones, that rely on conceptions of disability as lack of function and loss of fit. And in so doing, they participate in reproducing more of the same, even as they aim at social change. And I was going to use one more example, but I'm a little worried about my time. Have I gone over? I'm going to keep going. Okay, great. So one more example to help to nurture this politics of wonder. A new online practice, I participated in it today too, for public talks includes speakers beginning with a self-description, presumably as an access practice for the inclusion of blind and, and visually impaired people. Sometimes these descriptions include articulating markers of race, gender, or age. Sometimes what shirt one's wearing, I'm, I do have an orange shirt on, 
or what appears in the speaker's background on my many books. Providing access to some aspect of their appearance is typically followed by no one ever speaking their names, even in a multi-speaker event. The new describe yourself access practice reasserts an aspect of visual aesthetics while leaving established cited norms, norm, that organize participation untouched. Speakers' names are made available only to cited people in the small print below um, the, the, their image. PowerPoints, slides, or charts are not translated into a non-visual register. This describe yourself practice orchestrates a form of care or can orchestrate a form of careless caring in the face of an impairment imagined as lacking a momentary sighted aesthetic pleasure over and against robust participation with those so described. It also assumes that what blind people really want most of all is sighted people's sights. This inclusion practices, practice places people with visual impairments firmly on the edge of participation. And this edge, were it to be noticed, wondered about, would have so much to tell us about the use of sight in the formation, not only of aesthetic, but of knowledge, order, and the human imaginary. So just by way of concluding to why do we need caption moving image work and how to go about making it a given, Whatever we have done and will do, we have already created a version of a human community. We have already sketched the contours of belonging and the edges of exclusion. And this is why we need to ask the questions that Hannah and Sarah are asking. And that will help us do it anew, asking how we can disturb our peace. And I think that's how we can do it. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, um, I'm Louise and I am just completely um, inspired by Sarah, Hannah and Tanya kind of collective contribution tonight. Um, what a, a feat, like a, a feat to follow. And well, I'm, I'm really kind of, I'm, I'm going to do an audio description of a film tonight um, called Captioning on Captioning, which was commissioned by Lux um, Collect Film Collective. And I produced this film with Shannon, Shannon Finnegan, who is joined us tonight on the other side viewing. And I kind of, you know, by setting up this um, film tonight for you all, and I've never done a kind of live audio description, but before the events, uh, Sarah and I chatted a couple of times and really tried to think about pushing the kind of parameters of what audio description is as a kind of more performance. I've done performance kind of performative iterations of access work before. Um, as we go through the film, I will kind of step in and like try and give Kind of, it's very hard when you're doing audio descriptions that so dense with visual information such as captioning, not to go into director's mode, and especially being a, a lecturer in a previous life of um, undergraduate, not to go into a mode where I'm over explaining everything. So this is going to be a kind of interesting experiment to see how I kind of go move through this film. So why captions? Like, why have I come to this point where I kind of dissembled and taken apart all aspects of captioning and I have arrived at a point where I now think about quit AI. So like, how do we censor disabled people kind of disability-led design in the practice of thinking about network building, community building, technologies, and so forth. And, you know, it's really interesting, like, listening to Tanya discuss and, like, talk tonight. It's like, I first read Question of Access um, when I was 
alongside actually really really important um Alison Tafer's work um Crip Queer Feminist I forgot the title of the book Wow. Um, and what's really great about reading these two books alongside each other is that Alison Taper eloquently writes about disclosure. And then Tanya, as we just heard, talks about the question of access and how do we come to know access. And these work um, in conjunction with each other, but especially tonight, is they I can take the position of self-disclosing self my disability as being deaf. I, as I already said, I have been a deaf lecturer, so I have used captioning in a very different manner than um, what you might see when you're watching a media broadcasting when the captioning are at the bottom of the screen. I need captions, as, I'm going to say real time captioning as a way to signal where a real time captioning is at that moment of being in time with captions. Okay, so this is a very different temporality. And, the, and I'm going to kind of pause there and um, I'm going to ask the wonderful production staff to um, bring in the film. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. Pause. Yeah, this is how we're going to do it. I am going to say pause, and when then I'm going to provide a description. So the opening segment of this film is um, using the series of title cards that is handwritten by Shannon. And the first title card said, captioning on captioning, the film title. And what's interesting about this um, opening kind of title card, each of the title cards are new, the indexical sign, so the greater than sign. You can carry on. By Louise Hickman and Shannon Finnegan. I don't have your hold on. <laughs> I forgot to put the last name in. Hold on. This is the perfect start. We oh. are collaborating with Jennifer. So in this particular part of the film, it, um, Jennifer was actually captioning. Jennifer is the kind of other protagonist in the film, if you like, who is the captioner, like Andrew is from, with us tonight. Um, the um Jennifer was captioning the um our uh, names in the central of the image center of the image as we kind of move through the film. This will be explained in the next segment. I'm not going to provide an audio description of what's happening right now. And then we can go back to the film. Collaborating with Jennifer. Jennifer, I have a question for you. Can yeah. we call you Jennifer in the film? Yeah, there's enough of us. What? There's a lot of Jennifers. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Jennifers. Pause. We have another title card with the text, the handwritten text again, um, at, um, captioning is access work. When the footage that directly follows this, the real time um, captioner is um, describing her role in the classroom. And she writes, I provide cart captioning in the classroom for deaf with a big D and hard of hearing students and academia. You can play.
Jennifer's computer screen is open to the stenography software case cat catalyst. Um, this is the software Jennifer uses to produce CART, which stands for communication access real time translation. Also known as live captioning or real time captioning. As I speak, the readable text on the top half of the screen is the captions being created in real time. That text is white, uh, white captions on top of a black background. And then below in a separate window are Jennifer's uh, steno briefs. Um, as someone relatively new to the captioning world, the briefs basically look like a random mix of letters to me, but I understand that that randomness is actually um, a form of phonetic shorthand. Pause. Um, I Shannon has beautifully described the um, kind of audio description of the layout of the screen. Um, I should uh, I should add to this audio description of this liveness today is that this is like actually some of the difficulties Shannon and I have kind of struggled with is how to prioritize this information. So on screen, there are actually um, errors that appeared in the captioning. For example, live captioning appears first as tapping. And text is fleetingly appears as text. And then there's um, really appears rather than relatively. That is separated from the background. So there's these instances that appear on screen. And in the next um, kind of segment of the film, there is a really lovely moment where the kind of phonetics of what's being said, the actual phonetics is not in the immediately at hand in the dictionary. So there's this really nice moment, so carry on. It's beautiful that you don't have the brief for that. I do, but I was nervous and I couldn't, I didn't want to like try, I, I know it's in one stroke and I thought I had put it in with this, there it is, see, and so it's without the asterisk, and yeah, there you guys know, that's what happens when you're trying to, like, remember how you put it in your dictionary, that's what happens, like, did I put it with an asterisk or not an asterisk, that's what happens. Oh, the next title card is Access Work is Shaped by Relationship, and um, this is a, the, the section that um, follows is a rather visually overstimulated section where Jennifer is walking through her relationship with her dictionary. So there are columns and columns of phonetic shorthands that follows with colleagues of mine and these and um, Jennifer is kind of moving around on the screen of her laptop to kind of open up various parts of the dictionary to show how they are in situ so we can play on. So um, that just brings up my full dictionary. Cool. I've never seen this. Yeah. I can filter it for words I used a lot. Words I've never or ones I've never used because I did receive this dictionary from somebody else and kind of tailored it for me. Hmm. These are words that are entries that I've never used because they're just not something. Sort of 
And who, who's like intellectual property is the dictionary? Is that yours? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the, um, the whole thing about it, why it's so interesting is that Jennifer has to build a relationship with the dictionary. This one's Louise's that I have specifically for her when we were working with. Oh my God, oh, the people I know. It. But these are <laughs> original, like, remember when we first started, first, first, they're not the original. I lost that laptop and started the whole thing. I know. So these are stuff from your dissertation. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so. It's so fun. <laughs> That's why it was kind of like when you're telling me like, you're not going to tell me what you're going to talk about. It's kind of like scary to me because I'm like, do I want to go with my science-based dictionary or do I want to go with my sociology? -based? You know, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> right. Pause. We have another title card. Access work is hidden. Um, I just want to comment on the previous section is um, it's really interesting that even the, there were on screen, there were columns of text, but there was moments where the kind of movement between screens were punctuated by Shannon's um, own captioning of the film. So imagine the kind of multiple layers that are going on. Uh, there. there is the open captions versus the real-time captions. So that is another layer of the, the kind of visual information that is being presented. So we are going into the next section, which is has fewer windows, but the, there are three um, kind of Zoom windows, if you like, um, of the three kind of presenters of the film in the right hand column where Shannon and Jennifer and myself are depicted. And at, at various stages throughout the film, um, there are these moments where we're all in three different time zones. London, New York, and San Diego. And it's really nice because some of us are in dark and some of us are it's like daylight outside. Um, and we're often wearing um, different clothes. Or on Most often we're wearing the same clothes and that has um, tickled us at times where we're like, oh, we have the same outfit on. And there are different, um, different days. I'm not um, let's play on. Actually, it digs into the invisible labor that a captioner does before the meeting. If there was an opportunity for the stenographer slash real-time writer slash captioner to load up their dictionary before the meeting that actually saves a lot of trouble. And then there's ones where we have briefs for common words that come up a lot. I just put this one in because it was what I gave yesterday. Vulnerability. So vulnerable is like that. And then I add the T for the vulnerability. Mm. San Diego, because it comes up a lot. S-D-A-I-G. Um, mm. These are ones that I've programmed myself that might not necessarily be the same ones that everybody else uses. Yes, I know. There's coronavirus. There's COVID-19. There's COVID. I was just going to put in, I have. Mm. I was going to put in a brief for her. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. um, pause. We have another title with Access Word is a co production of priorities. And we can play on. When people are talking and they're going on and on, it's kind of like a stream of consciousness. The captioner 
you can see the captions sort of breaking down. Pause. We have another title card with Shannon's handwriting. It said, reading is not the same as listening. We can play on. These various variables going on, but like the person doesn't quite make sense, or the person speaking too fast or the person is using a language too esoteric. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing that you had that one, Jennifer. Pause. Um, the laughing that appeared on the previous screen was I was amused that uh, Jennifer had esoteric in her dictionary. And then I go on to self-narrate with my own access. Um, the, we have the last um, title card that says the end, and we can play on for a snor short snippet. And we, and we can pause and there uh, we have um, briefly popped up on screen was a, a gallery view that we can um, come familiarize with on Zoom. It's the three of us all position looking at the camera. And as I say goodbye, I wave my hand and the they other two kind of laugh at me. And then, and that is the, um, film and my audio description added in um, before we, um, I don't, if the production staff want to take this off screen, I can just um, bring this segment to a close and just add a note. Um, Thank you um, for doing that. Um, it's, um, I have to say that uh, Shannon and I have had a extensive conversation around the audio description version. We did not want to go back in and just describe the kind of technicalities that appear on the screen and rather really think about how audio description could actually reorder the narrative that we've just gone through and actually think about audio description as a form. Um, I'm going to leave it there and then um, I'm sure that Sarah um, would like us to have a five minutes break. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Tanya. That was just absolutely extraordinary. I can't believe that you quite did that live um, for us. It feels like such a, a generous thing. And I think we could have an event entirely just about the process of you doing that and being in process with you um, in this in this Zoom space together. It's, it's kind of magic. And Tanya, I feel like you've given us just so much to work with and so much that's so exciting. I'm going to send everyone off for a five minute break. Um, get some nutrition, get some sustenance, um, and please come back and join us in just five minutes um, when we'll, we'll come back um, for a conversation. You're really welcome to come and participate in that. We'll just say that, as you can see, what we're trying to do tonight is a kind of an, an attempt to evolve and think about, um, about how we do access around this event. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really open to your feedback. If you feel there are things about how we're doing things tonight, um, that you'd like to give us any notes on for the future um, and for the future events, please do get in touch with us. Um, we want to we want to try to tailor these to be as accessible as we possibly can. Um, so please do just um, get in touch and see you all in five minutes. Thanks, everyone.
Hi, everyone. Are we back online? Yes, we are. Great. Um, I'm just going to um, give a quick presentation um, tonight, um, just to kind of round out what I've just been speaking about in the film and the audio description and really just get into it a little bit more. Um, the, I was kind of um, kind of centering around the kind of idea of more abundance and less austerity. And this is something that um, I think many of us on either side of the Atlantic Ocean have experienced to some degree or another. Um, so to go next slide, please. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's really interesting that um, with Tanya being here tonight is, um, we, you know, I, in the film in itself, there's this moment where Jennifer refers to, um, you remember that laptop? You remember when I lost it? And what she was referring to was a moment there was actually a signal in my work. It was like um, Jennifer arrived into the classroom one day and she's like, I've lost everything. I've lost, and this, by this point in time, we've been together for two years. So we had worked closely. I started teaching undergrads. And there was, it was like, oh, I didn't really fully comprehend what Jennifer meant. And then the laptop came out and the, the captions came on. And I realized that all the words that I had been using prior, the kind of readings that I'd been doing as a graduate student, the, the kind of colleagues I had around the seminar table, their names, they were all gone. So um, one of my favorite one is, um, Baber and the theorist was mistaken for Dark Vader. So there were the conflicts between theorists and popular culture. And I had to kind of, I, I realized there was a kind of a relationship between the phonetics, you know, like how they appear on screen. And so this was my moment where I came. I, I realize the differences. And so if I, I want to kind of now open up a little bit and I, if we go to the next slide, um, on, on, on this particular slide, I have a collection of texts, including Tanya's work, um, Amy Henry, um, Beth Williamson, Sarah Hendren, Mary Alper, and these collective texts of Elizabeth Guffey, um, I am actually struggling to see the slides, but these collective texts, I would call a kind of a, a clustering, a merging ecology of critical access studies. You know, to these are the scholars that I kind of come to reckon with captioning in a kind of ecology of thinkers who are really thinking about how do we think about access in ways that are from the ground up, the co-production and from design, you know. So I really wanted to kind of signal that moment of like, this is a collective ecology. And what's really interesting in thinking about collective ecology is that I made the film with Shannon, that is a kind of a form of access intimacy. So not only as they, we kind of captured the relationship with Jennifer, there was the editing of the film after the fact. Like how do we go about prioritizing that access as well? There's something I cannot edit the film itself. So that is something that we spent a lot of time talking about how do we co-produce that? How do we come to an agreement? And then it was another segment of this is thinking about ecologies is in captioning and access is what's really interesting for me, captioning is a 
form of sociality. And so quite often you don't really read aloud. But if you read aloud a text, more often than not, the captioner will have that before the event and they will preload that. So there's not really the same encounter. And I, I name another colleague of mine, um, Kevin Gorton, and Kevin really is central, like Shannon tonight, in this conversation because it's a conversation, it's an unfolding of coming to knowledge and coming to understand captioning. So if we can move to the next slide, I just wanted to kind of quickly just signal here that when we're thinking about captioning, it's a phonetic, um, it's discursive. Um, actually, when captioners have to fingerspell, and fingerspell is um, something that is more familiar with sign language interpreters, is individual letters, but for a sonographer to do that, a real-time writer, they have to use multiple keys at once to spell out one letter. Whereas more often, what's more kind of what they're more used to, I feel strange saying this when Andrew is the expert thing in the this Zoom room with us. That what's happening does is that words can be um there's an output of words and short phrases too. So there's a temporality within the output of keying, which I kind of have on the screen here, this very kind of crude kind of, I love it, you know, it's a, a drawing of a, a phonetic keyboard and then and it's kind of a, a division of the keys and underneath is the valve, I think. I can't quite see it, but I believe that's what it is. If we can go to the next slide. Now, this slide um, is actually my new kind of newer work. And this is a emerged out of conversation with Kevin. Um, we had a conversation at another art gallery, Helm, in Amsterdam, outside Amsterdam. And in this conversation, we really kind of explored the kind of abundance of captioning. And what was really interesting about this is that I knew that content of the conversation to really think about the conflict of captioning itself. And so this slide here, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to um, hang on a moment, guys, because what I need to see is, um, is the actual slide pin. Okay, I've done it, everyone. I now can see what I'm presenting. So here I have a slide on screen with the phonetic A dash B G. And so this is Andrew, who is here tonight with us, might have a different um shorthand for access. But what's really interesting is that these Shorthand A slash dash BG is also academic and accreditation. So the three words and many others share the same phonetics. So this is where the relationship with the machine really emerges because the sonographer or real time writer, text of, they have so many names. I, I really like to kind of sample them all just to, you know signal the different roles um, is that they have to work and differentiate between these three terms to fit in within the kind of working culture. And, but if we go to the next slide, he, again we have PHA, that's a shorthand for machine, mental anguish, and Perot, completely different um, meaning, um, but I kind of, it tickles me that um, we three shorthand have such different um, outcomes. So if we move to the next slide, 
we're going to get back into this kind of, I've had this image up on the screen here of a kind of rather clunky machine. And this is a machine that was designed in 1985, if I remember rightly, and it's called a GT Tech Standard, and it was used in the United States. And what's really kind of special about this machine, this was the first real-time machine. So this is not the machine that you see when a sonographer is sitting in the courtroom on the law and order program, whatever prime program you might watch. Um, but this is a clunky machine that recorded a kind of um, a, a real-time computation output. I'm trying to not get technical, but I am nerdy about this because what emerged in this moment is that this rather clunky, clunky machine meant the one mobility for sonographers to move around. So let's go back to the kind of phonetic shorthand and go to the next slide. So this is interesting because I, the possible conflict that might arise is, you know, when you're watching Channel 4, um, Channel 24 News, 24 hour news, and you see the captions going along at the bottom, and you see these moments where there's like this kind of friction point where they're like, they're swapping, the words are swapping in and out. And it's because Captioning in many ways is discursive. So the moment that they're switching in and out is the work that's been going on behind the scenes where the sonographer is training their dictionary. And so to kind of, as we're kind of in this space tonight, we're in a gallery and we, Kevin and I spend a lot of time in this conversation. Don't forget, this is about our conversation. And this is what real-time captioning is, it's capturing conversation, it's forms of knowing, forms of um, epistemology, like quick epistemology. So here we have on the screen, we have another um, shorthand, which are the same heavy one I'm going to read out, is A-BG, we all know that actor, space S space PR. And this in my kind of fiddling around with this, is access is practice. And then the possible conflict for the same shorthand is access is appropriate. I cannot pronounce that word. We'll move on. The next one is acknowledge, acknowledge is proximate. Okay, now we can move on. So the possible conflicts are the real kind of shows how the languages and how machine interactions are not kind of configured in a way. There's always a relationship that is being built with the dictionary, with the and it's a and body process too. So I have a, another um kind of shorthand and this is um and I, I know that in many ways you don't have access to Kevin and I's conversation but you will in a minute but this is um you know so this is shorthand that result of our conversation and again I played with the boundaries of the possible conflict and I um so here we go we have this shorthand is K-A-O dash B-T-T space P-W space K-P-H-R dash P-B-S and this chaotic and compliant and it could also mean correct and common sense which I think I, I really when I was going reviewing this earlier and common sense came up on the conflict that it, it, it made sense when we're thinking about um, access and the phenomenology of access, you know, it's like common sense, what makes sense. So we can move to the next slide. Again, I just 
playing with the theme of abundance, I just put in the kind of um, shorthand, and we have A dash U B D Z. And this shorthand could, can mean abundance, objective, and observe. The potential outcomes are different. If we move to the next slide, I. So if, I, if we go back one slide, now I, I, I know I revealed everything now in my last slide, but I think I just want to really think about abundance for a moment. Abundance and austerity politics seem to have a point of friction. And this was something that was apparent in Kevin and I conversation. And then in this particular conversation, Kevin research um, as part of his residency at Helm in Amsterdam, um, what access was like for a deaf person and a deaf and blind person. And what he found, there was a particular um, assignment of particular um, set hours. So if you wanted to have a private conversation of this meaning at the exist outside education and work, you were allocated something like 38 hours a week. I, I, I don't quote me on that, but it's something like that. But I, and a, and a deaf and blind person would be allocated 168 hours a year. So there's this economy here, an economy of speech, economy of access. And so, you know, the, that space between what we just explored and rather and I'm, I'm rather dense exploration of shorthand and captioning, real-time captioning that is set aside from perhaps the media broadcasting. But if we now we'll go to the next slide, the one that I revealed to soon. And I, I included this image, um, which is a poster, which is depicted on the slide of access to work. And it's a poster from 2015. And it's a protest against the cuts to access work, which is a pot of money that the government provides disabled people to do their jobs. And in the drawing of this image, um, there are two interpreters, hands, in, I think, interpreting interpreters, I think. And in the, one of the hands is Ian Duncan Smith being squeezed really tightly, and he is showing discontent on his uh, face with boggling eyes. So, I'm now going to end this in uh, with this Ian Duncan Smith description, and then we're going to bounce back and think about uh, what ab abundance of access and less austerity could mean. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, that was absolutely marvellous. In a moment, I'm going to um, invite members of the audience to um, send in their questions. So if you'd like to ask Tanya and Louise anything, now is the time to start formulating those questions. You can pop them into the Q&A box um, on YouTube and they'll be channeled through to me here and I'll put them um, to Tanya and Louise. But maybe more immediately to give all of you out there um, who are tuning into the YouTube channel, a moment to gather your thoughts and put your, um, put your questions together in the text box. Um, something maybe that might bring together, um, though there's so much that brings them together, but to bring together Tania's and Louise's um, contributions tonight is to maybe pick up on that last point um, of Louise's in terms of thinking about access abundance in the context of austerity politics. And it reminded me of how in Tanya's work, Tanya talks about expense talk and the sort of expense talk that comes into play when we come to think about access, maybe particularly in public institutions. Um, in um, the question of access, Tanya writes um, 
incredibly cogently about how within the university, the student becomes um, instrumentalized and leveraged as a kind of economic unit that sort of qualifies for certain quantities of access and that connects so not neatly with what um, Louise just brought to us um, here. Louise's point about this last um, poster makes me, reminds me that I must um, send you Louise at uh, the poet Sean Bonney's amazing hex against Ian Duncan Smith, um, which everyone maybe should have access to in any case. Um, but maybe I wondered whether Tanya and Louise, you might like to think about and talk about this kind of question of expense talk, because I know that's something we're going to be doing across the series um, is having these workshops that are for artists and for arts workers. And when we propose this idea and when we talk to people about these workshops, people very often sort of immediately start to talk to us about budgets. And they say, we're going to have to think about what that means for our funding applications. We're gonna to have to think about our access budgets and maybe even dissolving the idea of an access budget as being something um, that we hive off in that way is something we could also think about. But maybe Tanya, Louise, if either of you would like to, to think first about this idea of expense talk and what that means for us in thinking about captioning, that would be great. Tanya, please. I'll go, okay, I'll go first, Tanya speaking. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very interesting how we can commodify so much where, where students become in Canada, uh, BIUs, basic income unit. And every basic income unit has an amount of space that they take up and an amount of resources that they use. And if anything is outside of being that basic income unit, you have to go seek extra um, funds to, to accommodate. But that sense that we have a logic that makes everybody uh, into a, a, an expense needs to, yeah, that needs, I think what you were just saying, Sarah, we need to, uh, instead of saying we're going to budget in access, I think we need to start thinking about what these, these budgeting events are asking us not not to think about and not to articulate and not to um, the, all the stuff that we assume is not an act of accommodation. So I, for me, it goes back to what form of perception is going to uh, depict the normal or the taken for granted or the that's just the way things are. And I think that's what we have to try and rupture or expose. Louise? Well, I, I was just thinking expense talk. Hmm. And I, I was reminded um, while you were talking earlier, Tanya, as well, is um, I've been at conferences where phonographers are seated in the room and they're uh, Kind of waiting and and then I, when they learn that what I do what I do and I obviously engage in conversations and quite often they the um, sonographers say we're just a part of the furniture right mm. so the invisibility of their how they think they are perceived in the room it's quite telling, and I think it's a kind of um, interesting way to think about expensive talk there. Is the kind of uh, how I, I, I talk about this and other aspects of my work is by like thinking about how we might position support services and how we are often a kind of position them in the background and then doing that we kind of have this front stage, back stage. And I think the economy of the expense mm -hmm. hall that we're kind of circling around now is really actually what is happening in the backstage that allows us to do the work that we do on the stage. And mm -hmm. I think especially thinking, I, I know I'm kind of gonna, um, but it, if you're thinking about automation, you know, that on Twitter, on social media, we see a lot 
um, of events been advertised as live transcription, which could mean two things, automated auto AI captions or a sonographer. So there's this slippery language there now that um, is being hidden, put it into the background again, we lose sight. So yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but I kind of really think there's a fun stage, backstage thing going in here when we're thinking about the economy of access. It absolutely um, makes sense, Louise. And I, I think that sort of sense of the, the front stage and backstage, and perhaps the degree to which lots of arts organizations and artists right now, very possibly when they talk about access, someone is pointing them towards automated services and saying, but sure, couldn't you get Google to do that for you? Do you really need to, to budget for that? And I feel that what Louise has done tonight in terms of thinking about the discursive work of the captioning and just how complex it is as a process and how much it happens between people, between people that are working with machinery, but between people at the same time, it's not something that can be sent out to an AI that somehow exists outside of human society, outside of understanding human relations. Um, and I think you kind of brought that home to us incredibly vividly tonight. I feel like I'll be pointing people back towards kind of how you spoke just now um, as a way to sort of explain the reason why we're making the kind of access provision demands that we need um, to be making. We do have a question from the audience for you, Louise, that I think maybe might allow you to kind of um, illuminate that process for us even a little bit more. So the question from the audience asked, how do automated captions do the conflict resolution that you explained in terms of stenography? Um, so I guess you're, you're thinking about what the, the difference is between those two processes. If you'd like to maybe describe, because it's a very, very different thing, at least as far as I understand it. Yeah, well, actually, I'm just going to give you a little anecdote, um, which just gives you the insight of the captioning world, I guess, is that um, we, a couple of years ago, I say recently, but we've been in this COVID bubble, so recently it seems longer, shorter than it is. Um, a sonographer that I know, in, based in New York, um, who is well-versed in doing captioning for medical schools. And the sonographer was like, oh, you know, I wanted to be a doctor, but I couldn't do it. So I captioned for medical students. And I, I mean, the reason I bring this up is medical school content circuits have approached this particular sonographer and offered them a, an amount of money, let's say $10,000, for their dictionary, right? And this is, I, I'm, I'm using this as an example because I, you know, there is a lot of conflict that comes up in automation, automated text. But I, I think this is a really nice story of showing you how the, the embodiment of the sonographers and their work have a value, but also being devalued at the same time. So I think this anecdote in itself is like really interesting because it kind of the, the conflict of real-time writing becomes more prevalent. But the conflict that I presented tonight is in many ways for a deaf viewer, and I'm going to situate it from that point of view, it's better to have a conflict that is being misspoken or mistyped by a sonographer than an automated text, um, automated by like, a captioning, but then um, there might be a similarity, and also sonographers have the ability to recognize that the text is out of place. 
and had the ability to have local knowledge that can correct that. And so, yeah, I'm going to end it there, but I hope that that kind of brings all the different sets together. It absolutely does, Louise. I, I feel like I should disclose to everybody that at the weekend I spent um, a very pleasurable time um, secretly reading Louise's PhD dissertation. And I think genuinely everyone should be um, excited about this, um, this manuscript in process. I'm really keen to read it now. I feel like I need it now. We all need it now. Um, but I'm excited about that. Um, I had a question I was thinking about, sort of that's really for both of you, but maybe Tanya could speak um, to this question to begin with. That some of the people I'm sure who are tuning in tonight will have come across the work of the art critic Emily Watlington, who's been really um, crucial in terms of bringing together and bringing to the to the fore and to sort of wide audiences um, the work, particularly of deaf artists who are using captioning. Um, and Watlington writes about the sort of, um, I guess, the resistance that there can be in museum and gallery contexts against the captioning of, um, of video work, and particularly against the captioning of historic works of video art, early works of video art. Mm. It's a really compelling argument for how these works were sort of radical from the start. They were deliberately meant to be accessible. They were meant to be relayed kind of in the broadest possible way, often via television, and that by refusing to caption them after the fact, the curators involved, I suppose, are sort of undoing something that is inherent to and integral to that work. Waddington writes about a kind of aesthetic distaste that exists in the art world against captions. And so I wondered, Tanya, if you might think about this kind of idea of what that aesthetic distaste might signify. Where does it come from? Maybe not specifically in terms of captions, but these kinds of aesthetic distastes um, that stop people making what could be made accessible, accessible. Where does that come from and how does it work? <laughs> That's a, a, a beautiful question, provocative question, an aesthetic distaste that seems to be so prevalent. But like, there's just this, um, even if it's possible, if it's cheap, if it's easy, it's still this uh, no uh, to alternative, well, I guess that's the issue, the, that the reality built or the, the ecology of the house has been built, white settler economy that has power, that has a form of embodiment, um, and that had, you know, that that's that's the house that's been built. The, and uh, any even you know even the easy um, alternative is a disruption, or is, and then becomes distasteful. But how do we get from we're going to disrupt the status quo to that's distasteful? And I guess it's um, I guess a, a a common way of protecting. The ordinary, the expected, the the man in the house, um, or the the version of the house and who it was built for, that doesn't need to be unsettled. Um, so we need distaste. That's a really interesting. That's more than I need to think something through. That's just distasteful. That's uh, you know that that changes my sense of um, pleasure or um, my sense of ease. So uh, I think I think that's why the artist, as the incorrigible disturber of the piece, quoting Baldwin there, um, the piece it might be that house that doesn't want to question who belongs or what fit looks like or what um, you know what what did we how did we come to build the world that we built, and it seems to me it's it's been for a very um, narrow version of the human. And we need to find ways, and the artists and creators can do that, to disrupt the conception of the human. But then we get a disruption and we think, oh, that's far enough. <laughs> the rest is distasteful. I just think distasteful is really an interesting term, too, because it's an embodied experience. Like, you think it's not coming from our culture, but, you know, oh, no, that's just distasteful. Almost as if it's objectively given and not subjectively arranged from a culture and uh, 
taken for granted versions of who belongs or um, what what fitting in means. Absolutely. I, I think that the attention that you draw to the kind of degree of like embodied somatic response that's kind of encoded in the idea of distaste is almost that sort of something embarrassing has happened in the in the sort of proposal that this could be captioned. Something has happened that makes everyone queasy, that makes everyone uneasy, and it's best kind of pushed under and forgotten. And I suppose that maybe what causes it to be pushed under is everyone's recognition that everything else around it hasn't been captioned. And to sort of to point at one aspect of the house and to sort of to acknowledge what's there that makes it inaccessible is to also make everyone look around the rest of the building. We need, you know, it's almost as though what the system needs or what the house needs is for us never to see the house is there at all for fear that we'll start kind of recognizing everywhere all of its kind of material components. We need to kind of experience it as immaterial and not be conscious of it. And I suppose that's where your kind of thinking about access as perception allows us also to kind of it, it uh, and there is an education of the sensorium as you describe but in the act of of reading you and 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 kind of thinking with you um with both of you in terms of kind of re reimagining how we start in thinking about access and sort of on a first principles basis um what that might mean how it might be done and kind of what what it is to bring it into question at all. I think that early on in your talk, Tanya, you talked about how there are all of these provisions that we kind of, that that the generality of people working maybe in arts institutions considered to be givens, considered to be kind of obvious things that need to be there. Um, and I know an early conversation that Hannah and I had was very much about sort of the architectural space of the gallery and what's presumed to be essential there. And Shannon Finnegan's work is, is really significant um, in that too. And we talked about that, the sort of sense of what is understood to be necessary to the viewing of the artwork, the fact that there ought to be lighting in the room, um, the fact that there needs to be a way to get a clear view as such of mm -hmm. the work that's installed on an opposite wall. Um, and I suppose that maybe what we, what we need to do to start thinking differently about access and differently about captions is to start paying attention to all of that provision that we presume to be a given that doesn't require an additional budget, doesn't require an extra an access, but is instead just kind of part of the furniture. This, all of these architectural furniture, interior, just kind of, they, they, they're coming back upon us over, over and over. Hi. Hi. I have a comment to add. Um, it's really interesting thinking about the aesthetics here because I think this really came out um, when Shannon and I were doing the editing of Captioning on Captioning. Um, and there's this section where I'm quite, I'm quite sentimental and I describe something being beautiful. And I remember watching that back and being like, oh no, I can't use that. It's, you know, it steps outside the professional persona that I want, right? But what's really interesting about that kind of moment, that realization um, is when we initially went into the project, we wanted to document failures of captioning Right? And we wanted to show those moments, but actually what we ended up with, that there was this close alignment with our own speech as well. Like this, this tendency, I want to edit out those moments because they are they're not, they're not quite right. And so in many ways, we've purposely left moments like that. And because I think that kind of, gesture towards automation as well you know we, we there's this process of kind of flattening language and it becomes a medium of moving information from one to another it does feel like that the um the work of the artists that we're going to show besides your own um and shannon's work tonight louise but also the work in the next um screening event that'll be on the 14th um, I think does something to to unflatten that language and to kind of to think differently 
as as sort of as Tanya's talk started out with to think differently about what captions can be and sort of what creativity and what sort of richness and what kind of aesthetic and linguistic and poetic thinking can be happening through captioning and through the relation between language and image and language and sound um, in that work. I feel that maybe what it kind of behoves me to do at this point is maybe just before we finish up as a very last question um, is to ask Tanya and Louise if they'd like to ask each other anything. It seems wrong to bring um, two such just wonderful and two such, um, I don't know how to even to say it, sort of two such collegial and connected um, thinkers and speakers together without giving you a chance to, to ask each other a question. So if either of you has a question, maybe we could ask that last question um, and then we'll wrap up and, um, and say goodnight. Louise, it's Tanya speaking. Uh, at one point in your uh, presentation, you talked about it's not really the same and there almost sounded like there was a lament, but then you went and said, you know, captioning is like, a, it's a conversation, it's an understanding. And I got the sense that it's a language, which would definitely mean the captioning is not trying to get at a sameness. If, if captioning is, la is, is its own language, I, I wonder what, it, what it's being is about about you know I don't know what my question is except to say I love how you how you move from conversation understanding language mm. well actually I do think there is a grammar of accessibility and I think um there are scholars out there uh, who study the linguistics of sign language, right? And I think the same could be said for captioning, right? Um, when you work with a particular um, writer, um, the person who is writing tonight, Andrew, we have worked together in other meetings um, in my prior, my prior job, we have an understanding that there is the um, existence, but I think I flagged up in the audio description of the film, um, the two indexical um, kind of, um, two indexical, greater than sign. Um, are really kind of interesting because they do signal a new speaker, right? And you think, well, that's quite straightforward, right? But a captioner can move to a new line because they're signaling a change of a conversation or a change of a pace of a conversation or a pace of stream of consciousness. And so it's not a new speaker, but it's like a new a moment, it's a new arrival, mm. right? Mm. And so I, I think, you know, in, in the, the new work that I've been done to deny about thinking more about the abundance is actually looking at the conflict where we could potentially go and how does one train that dictionary uh, it again rested on the idea that, you know, there is a grammar of accessibility. And I think that really speaks to your work, Tanya. And I, and I, I think um, thinking about the kind of, I, I have it in my notes here, you know, uh, the kind of the politics of wonder, right? And I guess, you know, it's, I, being with your work for so long, you know, I wonder how does your kind of work resonate with new technology? And can you comment on that? And like thinking about, and it doesn't necessarily have to be captioning, but even just thinking about, you mentioned earlier about Zoom, but you know, yeah. With the politics of wonder, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I have uh, very many tenuous, relate, personal tenuous relations with technology. 
and uh, including this computer, which could kick me off the Zoom at any moment if it gets too hot. Um, but politics of wonder is a way to slow a person down. I wish it would slow my computer down a little bit too. And uh, try and say, uh, you know, what grounds the possibility of this technology? What, what version of the of humanness, of interaction? Um, Louise, as you were saying, like, uh, who are we supposed to be? And what kind of relationship are we supposed to have with each other such that this technology works? or this new accessibility practice works or doesn't work. So the politics of wonder is a chance to just pause, slow down and figure out what we've already produced. And in that act, I think there is creation. There's a new story to be told. There's a new depiction to be had. There's a new narrative to be released in trying to confront what we've already done and what we've already thought and what we've already made of each other. So I, that's, I hope that's my relationship to technology. Other than getting really anxious about it and wanting to do something nasty to my computer or it wants to do something nasty to me, uh, to try and wonder like, who, who did it expect? What sort of relationship did it want? Um, could I, could I re-narrate that, retell that in, in a way that might open up possibilities for um, something alternative, a better world? I think I really like that you signal slowing down there. Uh, I think that's a really interesting taste, like a turn there that we are familiar with in disability studies. And, you know, in perhaps I would say, I would be say that we should actually sit with mistakes more, human made mistakes, you know, um, and be okay with the fact that when we're watching 24 hour news, that the captions are not quite on point. We should kind of, celebrate those mistakes and stick with those mistakes as a way of recognizing its labor, it's a human labor, and that desiring this kind of technology that becomes frictionless is not necessarily the best outcome. So I really kind of like that nod, the slowing down, and it's a way of reflective moment. Thank you, Louise. Um, Sarah speaking again, I realize as you speak about these human made mistakes, um, Louise, that in spite of having written numerous notes to myself on the desk, I have not been um, reminding everyone of who I am as I begin to speak throughout the night. And I think that this um, call that both of you have brought to us at the end to slow down um, and to reflect on, on how we've been doing and how things are going on what this process is and the experiment that we're engaged in. Um, we will be doing that. We will be thinking back on, um, on tonight, how this has all worked, what hasn't worked and what we'd like to do differently. And one thing I'll be doing um, is letting everyone know who it is that's speaking um, when I start. But I'm gonna stop speaking now. And instead, I'm gonna thank everyone so much um, for being here tonight, for making this possible. It's been absolutely um, magic. I want to thank um, my co-organizer beyond compare, um, Hannah Wallace, to thank everyone at Nottingham Contemporary, but especially tonight, Catherine Masters, who's been handling this complicated tech um, setup, to Jen Ann Batur for handling things behind the scenes and public programs, to Jim Brewer in live programs too, um, for handling things in tech, to Ryan Carney, no longer with Nottingham Contemporary, but much, much um, involved in this program in its, in its preparation. Um, to date and to Sam Thorne for enthusiasm and support um, for this project and our collaboration. I want to thank very sincerely and, and enthusiastically our BSL interpreters, Rebecca Spencer and Sarah Perks, particularly for handling the contingency and the sort of reality of an ill colleague at the last moment um, and for managing to, to deal with that in an extraordinary way um, tonight. We really appreciate that. We are all bodies um, being together in doing all of this and, um, and thank you for that and to thank Andrew 
for um for his captioning and i love the fact that louise and andrew have this behind the scenes um sort of intimate access relationship um that we weren't aware of before but that i think is is again meaningful and means something um to our audience tonight um, we want to thank the ahrc for supporting uh, the voices in the gallery and to thank louise and tanya for being in every way absolutely tremendous tonight i'm going to be scrutinizing my notes but I'm also going to have access in the future, as will you all, um, to the video of this event that will be edited and put back um, on the Nottingham Contemporary site in future. And we will make sure to let people know um, when that goes out. Um, thanks all, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for your time. And do get in touch if you have any thoughts. Thank you. Bye bye.